Now, I would like to introduce our speaker. I think you've all seen his bio online. He's the Assistant Professor of Emergent Technologies at the School of Architecture and Design at the University of New Mexico. Emergent Technologies, how cool is that? And so when we heard this, we knew he was going to be the perfect fit for a robot. And so without any further ado, here is Alex Webb. Can you all hear me okay? Excellent. Um, thank you so much to Creative Mornings for having me here. It's a real honor <laughs> to be here. <sighs> Sorry, I blew it. <laughs> <laughs> now you guys know it's all given away. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, like Roxanne said, I'm a registered architect here in New Mexico. I teach architecture at the School of Architecture and Planning. So, obviously, I'm here to talk to you about robots. Um, it might seem like a slightly odd fit, and, and I'm actually really glad that, a, that an architect was selected because I do believe that we have a lot of light and a different perspective to shed on, on robots. And um, there's two sort of halves of the presentation I'm going to cover today. Architecture with robots, so how robots are being used within architecture at this moment. Then also, architecture for robots. Why we should be considering designing buildings and spaces for robots. And embedded in that is how, does, how architects and designers might be able to shed some light upon how we think of artificial intelligence. So, figuring out the clicker. Play button. Play button. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> um, so there is a, a very, actually, a fairly substantial history of, of robotics in architecture, going back to Fritz Lang's Metropolis, which proposed an almost entirely <coughs> robotic city. The proposals of firms like uh, Archigram in the 60s were describing um, cities that could actually get, pick themselves up and move around and reposition themselves based off of whatever conditions they were responding to. In the 70s, the um, interest in environmental um, efficiency and the energy crisis led architects to look to robotics as a mechanism for, uh, for harnessing new types of environmental performance within their buildings. So the sculptured house is actually a building that rotates and follows the path of the sun throughout the day. In the 80s um, and 90s, architects like Jean Nouvel and uh, Norman Foster were looking towards how dispersing their robots throughout an architecture could, let, could increase the level of performance within the building. So, and the Institut de Mondorab, the facade is a series of oculi that open and close based off of how much solar exposure that facade is getting. And I think it's interesting to note that uh, at this time, the, the rest of the architecture was very much a celebration of the mechanical, the exposed structure, the, uh, the metal finishes on the, uh, on the interiors. You actually kind of feel like you're in the torso of a robot. I mean, it's very much uh, a robotic sense of the space. And contemporary, um, con uh, the contemporary approach to robots is actually somewhat different. Um, we're, as designers, we're taking cues from Apple and making our designs much more streamlined and kind of hiding all the nuts and bolts that go into uh, buildings. The Nest thermostat is a fantastic example of this. Um, most of you probably know about the Nest, but those who don't, the Nest is a, um, is a, a, a predictive thermostat. So as you add input to what temperature you'd like your, your space to be, the Nest actually records the environmental information and actually becomes predictive, starts to um, decide for you what you would actually probably like that temperature to be for you. Um, it's sort of a form of weak artificial intelligence. It's, a, uh, it's um, a, an artificial intelligence that can do one function very, very well, but really it's not a very wide scope of intelligence in that sense. All these ideas are, by, are really entrenched in a modernist idea that architecture itself is a machine. Um, the modernist architect Luc Cabussier and, and others were really interested in stripping architecture uh, from ideas of or ornamentality um, and uh, decoration 
and making, it, making architecture pure expressions of function. So in that sense, when Le Corbusier was say, said the house is a machine for living, he wanted to present ideas of performance and function in architecture rather than having <coughs> of a specific style or a specific look. But that question, that, that statement then begs the question, well, what does that machine do? All the examples of architecture I've, I've described to you are actually very sort of baseline functional con concepts of what an architecture is. It provides enclosure, it mediates a, an environment, it creates a, a, a degree of interior conditioning. But architecture is about space, architecture is about experience, architecture is about social connection. And this is where, um, where my students this last spring have actually been um, investigating is how can robotics can actually enhance those ideas of performance and those ideas of architecture within them. This is a, pro a project by Hong Bon, who's actually here. Talk to him afterwards, he's brilliant. He's describing a project of a, an adaptable facade that opens and closed based off of your social network information. So essentially the, the building would suggest to you who you're connected to through social networks or who you have similar interests to based off of uh, information right off of your smartphone. And we'll try to get this video going. But this is a prototype he made, a robotic prototype he made, of an adaptive skin system that could begin to open and close and create views and passage and visible connections um, based off of, in this case, it's a connects acting as a proxy for social information. But it's a proof of concept that once the technology is developed to read that information, that this this could actually be a very near future uh, uh, project. I, I firmly believe someone will be doing this in the next five years, hopefully home. And that's, and that, so that's a near future propo proposal, but I think that in a lot of ways, um, architecture has actually served as forecasting for further futures um, fairly frequently. In the case of the Disneyland's plastic house, fortunately, this, this future did not come true. <laughs> we are not living in plastic bubbles, and we are all thankful for that. However, it does, it's a great demonstration of how architecture can serve to, um, to forecast a possible future, if not the correct one. And with that in mind, I think that we should actually take very seriously the idea that architecture that we may be designing for robots as inhabitants of architecture as much as people. And of course, as soon as you suggest that, everyone immediately says, wait, 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 wait. No, no, no. They're going to kill us. We can't, we can't, no, we can't do this. The robots, they're going to kill us. They're going to take over the world in all sorts of amazing ways. Um, it's, it's, I, I hope there's a way to archive all of your answers of how the robots will take over the world because I saw like the most amazing uh, examples of that uh, just this morning. But there's, there is a fear of robots, and this is something that's been reinforced in thousands of science fiction films. And there's just every single example of an entity gaining intelligence, an entity gaining agency within the physical world, that's exactly the moment where that entity destroys us all. And I found myself really wondering about this. Is there something that's actually scary about robots? Or is this more about us? And I think there's an idea of the other. That as human beings, we have an inherent fear of the other. And a, a great example of this is the TV show Lost, where the bad guys in the TV show are the others. And throughout the uh, six seasons of the show, the survivors of the plane are in constant conflict with the others. But what I think is really fascinating is that the others, throughout the, con throughout the duration of the show, keeps, keeps on changing. It's not a fixed set of people. It keeps on, the, the, the us expands, and the others get so small. In fact, at the end of the show, it's just one guy, and he dies. So, sorry. <laughs> Aren't you, aren't you supposed to say spoiler alert or something? I, 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 I'm new at this. I apologize. Well, season one. <laughs> well, yes, yes, season one. Um, 
And even though this is a very different pattern, it's a very similar phenomenon. If we look at the US voting privileges, it actually started with a very core small group of white Protestant property holding males. And throughout the course of US history, and this is by no means true, don't, I mean, any historian would absolutely destroy this, but I want to, I, this demonstrates how the idea of the us and the idea of the other constantly shifts and expands. We become much more inclusive as, uh, as we progress. So I think a really interesting uh, leading indicator of who is on the cusp of becoming an us as opposed to an other is who we date, who we're in relationships with. And though most people in this room are probably not in relationships with robots at the moment, um, certainly there are several people in this room who are in relationships that have been facilitated by digital applications or, in some cases, by robots themselves. Or your, the uh, physical part of your relationship has been enhanced by robots. According to The Economist, that's actually becoming more and more common. Um, but I, so I, I'm not, I guess I'm, I'm saying that maybe the relationships aren't happening with robots, but as robotic entities are becoming, um, becoming brokers of human relationships, that might be giving them agency and actually making them become a little bit more of the us, a little bit less of the other. And of course there are actually a growing number of people and growing industries oriented around people within relationships with robots. This is uh, Lady Gaga and her officially endorsed Gaga doll. This is a love doll. It's a product made in Japan. And the, uh, the, 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 the people who are in what they actually describe as relationships um, with the dolls are um, describe, actually describe them in, in the sense of relationships, that they seek the dolls for companionship. They talk with the dolls. They have, uh, they have much more than just physical relationships with the dolls. And um, this is a, this is a, as, I believe this is a leading indicator that as we, as this becomes more and more commonplace, we will actually start to see um, the, uh, the, the robot becoming more of our fold. And, and those dolls actually, some of them are robotic. Some of them have weak forms of artificial intelligence, essentially a Siri embedded in them where people can interact with them. Um, I don't think it's a coincidence that the love doll industry and the android slash robot industries are both coming from Japan. Um, Hiroshi Ishiguro is a roboticist. This is him with his android. Um, and he, <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> He is. Is um, he in a relationship with his robot? I know. <laughs> you would have to ask Hiroshi. I don't believe so. No. Um, but it's it's interesting. According to Hiroshi, if you are raised in a um, in a Shinto framework, in a traditional Japanese framework, the idea that objects have a spirit, have a soul, have a character, is not that unusual. So therefore, there's nothing strange about the robot that you create having a degree of personality, having a degree of character as well. So as these robots become more and more lifelike, if this worldview towards objects becomes much, um, more robust, um, we may see more and more androids being accepted within our society. And certainly this is, um, unfortunately these were slides I had to delete because they went way over in time-wise, but um, contemporary philosophy, the, or object-oriented ontologists, the new materialists, are also very fast, are really pushing this idea that we should devalue the, the notion of us, devalue the notion of the object that we perceive, and start accepting objects that are around us in sort of a more environmental, ecological relationship, something that a, a philosopher, um, Timothy Morton, would call the mesh. That we are all interconnected. And we are actually, the environmental crisis we're facing is actually a product of being so singularly focused and not ecologically focused. With this in mind, um, this is a design proposal that I, I um, submitted to the Arctic States Competition. It was a winner. Um, in a hypothetical situation where in 100 years the polar ice caps have melted and global warming has rendered the planet almost entirely uninhabitable. 
So the only, in this scenario, the only uh, survivable parts of the planet are the polar ice caps and the Himalayan pl plateau. If this was to exist, then um, maintaining biodiversity for a diet would actually become critical to humanity's existence. So these three locales become um, entrenched in a, a very complex seed exchange to make sure that um, people have robust diets. And that because of the distances, um, drones become a critical component in sharing the seeds and maintaining bi that biodiversity. So in this sense, the um, people, um, drones, and building are on a much more symbiotic relationship. It's much less of a hierarchy where we have created these objects and much more of a, a, a symbiosis where there's equal relationships and we are all mutually dependent on each other for our survivals. And in this sense, this is bringing, a, um, a, starting to pave the way for understanding robots as us. Robots as, at least on equal footing, to us. Whether sentient or not. And I think that when we are, we are discussing artificial intelligence and robots, we're actually using a very outdated model of design. Um, we are thinking, we are approaching artificial intelligence as something that we would create, something that we would bring upon an otherwise inanimate object and make animate. This is a really self-serving metaphor, essentially in the sense we're God. And um, if, we, if history uh, can shed some light on this, typically these kind of situations don't produce very robust uh, responses to the design problems. And that, <coughs> So the, the modernist archetype is this solo genius. This is the, the modernist idea of an architect. This is, is the one man against the world, the Howard Rourke of the Frank Lloyd Wright, where they <coughs> shake their sleeves and great designs fall out. And that there's this, this lone genius who has the power to make, make beautiful and compelling buildings engage with the entire city. And this is a very dated approach to the role of the designer, at least in architecture. We're embracing a much more networked, a much more flat approach. We're less Superman, more Nick Fury in the Avengers, where we bring teams of, of highly focused experts together. And we're, we facilitate the collaboration rather than implement the idea that we have. And in doing so, one of the tools we, use, we leverage very heavily is actually computer code, where we'll investigate uh, um, a sort of sense of performance that we'd like to have in our buildings, come up with formal relationships, and basically script those relationships within the computer. And that creates an emergent design. It's not in a design of a building that we have in our head initially. It's a design that um, is a surprise to us. It's something that, that, that comes out of the genetic algorithms that we write. So we utilize evolution very heavily. And I believe that there may be a really interesting analog here in terms of artificial intelligence. When you think that the majority of connections and communications over the internet are not initiated by human beings, that spider bots and spam bots are trolling the internet, is it that far of a reach to think that these small programs, these weak AIs, are the evolutionary equivalent of single-celled organisms in a primordial ooze. And that as they interact with each other and as they um, develop, that a more strong AI, a more robust evolutionary AI may emerge from this condition. And given that, how do we know that hasn't actually happened yet? And the sentience hasn't bothered to contact us and they're just, they're just waiting, they're just yeah. amused and watching. <laughs> I think that it also, we also then should take seriously that an artificial intelligence that's a product of the internet would be interested in having agency in the physical sphere. We're interested in having agency in the digital sphere and in interacting with a digital information. Why would that entity not want to engage in our sphere as well? And I, I guess this is a spoiler alert. Um, I don't believe that we will have fleets of metal mammals scurrying around. 
that an artificial intelligence will probably be a much more distributed model. So think Jarvis in the Iron Man movies, where there is a, a cloud-hosted entity that then has agency through a variety of mechanisms within this physical sphere. So, given, so architect, well, so architects look at societal conditions and cultural trends and create designs to respond to those, uh, to those conditions and trends and to engage with them through architecture. And given the idea that uh, there will be technological development in robotics, given the idea that there will be a breaking, da breaking down of the us, um, a robot uh, as other, and an inclusion of robot as us, and given that um, there, will, there will probably be a robust artificial intelligence sooner than we expect, then the question becomes, how do you design for consciousness that's not tethered to a single body? That's a question I'll leave you with today. Thank you so much for having me, and this has been a pleasure. <laughs>